We thank you that we can be here Amen. and enjoy your word. Your word means life, eternal life. Mm -hmm. And I pray blessing for Shivkon. I pray blessing for us. We want to see you glorified. May your name be glorified. Thank you, Jesus. Bless us in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Marina. Well, Christos Anesti. This is the Greek phrase of... Here we go. Christ is risen. It's such a such a powerful statement. It's such a powerful statement. Have you thought about, about that? I mean, it, it sounds very simple when you say it. But Christ is risen. Mm -hmm. Such a wonderful hope. And I would say, this is the indescribable freedom in which the church lives and moves. Mm -hmm. This is the freedom in which we thrive. This is our hope. Christ is risen. In general, the church in Macedonia celebrates Easter and Christmas according to the Julian calendar, you know. So we're a week late or you're a week earlier. I'm not sure what's the, what's, what's the correct answer to that. Anyway, however you put it, the final unraveling of the resurrection came to be a week earlier. So it doesn't matter if it's a week earlier or a week later, my message is going to be connected to... to to two events that I, I call, my message is called the stone. The stone, because there are stones, you know, it, the stone in the New Testament is such an important key. Mm -hmm. It comes here and there, you know, it appears in, in certain stories, in certain events, and it's such an important topic. So, there was a stone a week before the resurrection. During the resurrection, obviously there was a stone. And there was a time between those two stones that were, were, were rolled away, which I want, to, I want to talk about today. Now, what, what happened after the first rolling away of the stone was the glorious entrance in Jerusalem, you know, the Palm Sunday, the last sermon in the temple about the living water, who is the living water? The Lord's Supper, the Gethsemane Garden, the arrest, the crucifixion, and then the second stone, the resurrection. Now, the theme from today's message is from John's Gospel, which is my favorite Gospel, I have to say. John, I'm just going to share a few information about the Gospel. John wrote that Gospel uh, when he was really old, maybe 90. So, Everything you see in that gospel, everything you read in that gospel, there, is not, there, is, there are no coincidences. So every detail is important. And John is not rushing through. He's not in prison to write it fast like Paul. You know, he was, Paul was writing his epistles on the move. He was basically dictating them and somebody was writing it. And as soon as he got the pen, he would say, See, I'm writing this with my own hand. You can see it. These are my letters. You know, this is my handwriting. But John took his time. John took his time to remember, to remember, remember details, even feelings, even some, some like uh, meeting of some, some, some eyes, like, you know, when, Je when Jesus says, one of you will betray me. And then John set up this beautiful scene, like, well, I was uh, the, the disciple that Jesus loves, you know. It's him, probably, you know was uh, resting on Jesus's, I don't know where, they were like, you know, it's, it's a huddle, it's boys, they just huddle together, that's how they sit. And Peter just looked at John, like, just motioned to him, like, ask who it is, and then John asks. And those, these are the details that I love in the Gospel of John, it's so, it's such a rich and deep Gospel. It's, it's full of emotion, because John remembers, and he hopes that this message will continue after them. It's the last apostle that remained alive. It's him. And he sees the church in stated, no other apostle saw it. So he writes this gospel with such a passion that I, can, I cannot even sing the other gospel. I mean, all the other gospels has their own beauty and significance, of course. But the gospel of John, to me, it really grew closer to my heart. 
So the message for today is going to be from the 20th chapter of John, but which we're going to read a bit later. But I, I want to start a bit earlier. The sequence of the 20th chapter starts earlier. Because it starts during the chapter 12, and I believe it starts a bit earlier than that, even in chapter 11, with the resurrection of Lazarus. So I'm going to read John 11 for now. 38 to 44, it's quite known text. You know, Jesus received a message that, that his friend Lazarus is sick, and uh, they're waiting for him to come, and Jesus is not in a rush, which is weird, because he really loved Lazarus. And then a few days later, he travels there, and obviously Lazarus is dead. So this is what happens. Then Jesus, deeply moved, he already met the two sisters, Martha and Mary, and then says, then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an order, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, said to her Did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the, of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had, who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him, let him go. Set him free. I grew up in a village in the east part of Macedonia. And it was a village. That, that was way before uh, we moved to Croatia and met Marino there in the war zone. So it was a safe village where I could actually walk around free. Nobody cared where I am. I was so free. I mean, I mean it, was, it was great. Uh, I barely remember that period of my life, actually. <laughs> but there is a feeling that there was freedom there. So I grew up in this village in, in Macedonia. And I remember one Saturday morning, few of my preschool friends, girls, all of them, came to our door, clothed in traditional Macedonian garments, with baskets, collecting eggs, and singing songs. I was like, what is that? I know I see them in the preschool, but... What is happening here now? What, what's this? So I asked my, my, my grandmother, I was like, what is this? And my grandmother, Marina knows her. She's, a, she's an interesting character. She whispers things that she, she, she can freely say out loud. <laughs> but she would say out loud things that she would whisper. <laughs> she should whisper, yeah. So what happens? She's like, those are the Lazarines. She's like, wow, what is that? I had no idea what was that. So basically, years later, and I, I didn't dare to ask, what is this? I mean, what are they doing? Is that a ritual or something? So I found out that it was the Lazarus Saturday, the day when the La Lazarus was resurrected. So that was a tradition where the, the young girls would go from house to house, sing the song about the Lazarus resurrected, and collect eggs, which would actually signify the, the rebirth of new life. The, 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 that, that would be the symbolism. And... Nothing scary about that, but the way she whispered was, <laughs> was crazy. So, regarding, coming back to the Gospel of John and the scene that is set up before us, we cannot miss the fact that John has a certain agenda of how he writes his Gospel. It's, a, it's very clear about that, from the very start until the very, very end. And this is my favorite Gospel, I told you. The way he records the sign from the very first one, with the water turned into wine, right? And the very last sign, the resurrection of Lazarus, there is a sequence of signs he puts together, which he wants to represent, he presents his audience of under which things Jesus has authority. He wants to represent who is Jesus. So he has the authority over the nature, water turning into wine, Jesus was a fun character, I'd say. Feeding the 5,000, you know, and there is the important Jewish tradition. Jesus has 
Jesus is the Lord over the Sabbath. There is a miracle recorded how he actually performed on the Sabbath, which was a scandal back then. So Jesus is, has authority over the Sabbath. And at the very end, the resurrection of Lazarus represents that Jesus, he has authority over life and death. So if you have a question who he is, John has the answer for you. He will tell you, listen, this is what I saw. This is what I experienced. You judge for yourself, who could this man be? Who can do that? Tell me. You tell me. You define to me. Who is this man that can actually manufacture nature at his will, calm the storm, multiply the bread, heal the sick, and even resurrect the dead? Who, who could do that? You tell me. I just tell you what I experienced. At the end of the gospel, he concludes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is who Jesus is. If you want to know who he is, ask yourself. Now, the Lazarus miracle cannot be found in any other gospel. Even though it's such a great miracle, it's, you can find it only in the Gospel of John. The possibility is, there are some commentaries, co commentaries from scholars that says that during the writing of the other three Gospels that were written a bit earlier, there might have been that the Lazarus was still alive. And they wanted to not expose him, his, his character, who he was, because uh, Jewish, uh, I mean the Judeans, as they were after Jesus, so they were after Lazarus. Because this is, this is one of the... They decided to kill Jesus and Lazarus. Because Lazarus... Well, they, they got rid of Jesus. But Lazarus was resurrected from the dead by Jesus. So he was a living proof of everything the church preached from the very early. That Jesus can perform those miracles. So they wanted, they wanted to get rid of Lazarus. So they, they supposed that Lazarus was still alive during the, the other three Gospels. So when John was writing his Gospel... It was really safe to write about Lazarus. No, this is not, this is not from the text. It's, it's some kind of an interpretation, interpretation of the situation. This could be the possibility. I have to put it down now. Why this resurrection story was so special? It was not the only story that was about resurrection. Obviously, there was another story about the girl who was dead. You know? And when Jesus healed her... I mean, he told them, don't, don't tell anyone about this, right? They obviously did. But there was another resurrection story. But this story could be under speculations. Because the, the girl that died, she was still on her deathbed. You know, she was not in the grave or something. So there could be speculations. So, well, she might not have been dead. You know, she might be unconscious or something. So something coincidentally happened. Okay. But there was one other story. You know, the son of the widow? He was actually... I mean, can you imagine the timing? They were, going, they were on, the, on the way to bury him. And Jesus met them. Like, on the way. They, they were on the way. Can you believe about the timing? What if Jesus was five minutes late? He would have been in the grave. So, the timing is amazing. But, Jesus resurrected, resurrected the son of the widow as well. But why is this Lazarus story so important and so special? With the resurrection of Lazarus, the political situation in Israel changed. The very political situation of Israel changed. It changed their policies. It changed everything. Until the resurrection of Lazarus, Jesus was famous, okay, yeah, because wherever he was, there were crowds. But he was irritating for them, you know, for the, for the, for the ruling party. It was just, they were just irritated by Jesus. He was not dangerous. He was just irritating. They, they had a hard time to understand him. What, what does he want? He's not building an army. He's not, like, cursing the Romans. I mean, he told us to pay taxes. What's wrong with him? I mean, we cannot understand him. What, like, what does he want, you know? He, he's very hard to predict. They, they, I mean, he's just annoying, you know. They cannot... Put him under certain certain category. They try to frame him many times. He somehow gets away, as though he's reading their minds. You know. 
and he escapes every time, very successfully. Now the atmosphere was changed, and listen what happened. John 11, 47 to 53 says, So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council, the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe, believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Everything is at stake here. Now don't fool yourself. Everything is at stake here. It's all or nothing. All the eggs are in one basket. <laughs> there is no other basket. It's him or us. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should, be, should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. So interesting. Now, listen how John unravels this. Years later of the, after these words, like maybe 50 years after the, the, the high priest said these words. He says, He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. What John is trying to say that the high priest didn't even know that he was actually prophesying at that moment. That is so crazy. I cannot wrap my mind around it. I thought the prophets that are prophesying should be the best of all of us. He was not the best, believe me. <laughs> he was really after the power. He didn't care about anything else. But, John said, he was not even aware that he actually prophesied that Jesus would die one for all of us. Such a beautiful statement. And not for the nation only, but also together into one, the children of God who are scattered abroad so from that day on, listen to this policy. From that day on, they made plans to put him to death, period. They had state of emergency. You know, during the corona time, the president, <laughs> the president put together all, all the ruling parties and they discussed, what are we going to do? What is going to be? I mean, they had to agree, all of them, to do something. So this is what basically happened. They called the state of emergency. What are we going to do? We're going to lose everything. Guys, wake up. This Jesus is doing crazy stuff. We have to do something about this. They officially made plans to put Jesus to death. This was the only remaining option. There was no other option. There was no plan B. So at all costs, Jesus had to die. There was no other way. And now the miracle of Lazarus. I'm just, you know, the story goes like this. Jesus goes there, he meets Martha, and they talk there, and she says, Oh, if you were here, my brother would have lived. And then, and then she says, Well, even now, if you ask your father, I know that he's going to listen to you. And then Mary comes, and then Jesus cries. But then it says, Then Jesus deeply moved again, 38 and 39 verse. Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Now, you know, we know the ending of the story, so it's easy to comprehend this. As a pastor, I had my own share of funerals. So, funerals, I mean, it doesn't matter how beautiful they look like. What would happen if I go to the, to the graveyard and say, dig up this grave? What do you think the reaction would be like? like what is the matter with you? I mean, what is the goal of the, I mean, this is the strangest command by Jesus. Take away the stone. Dig up this grave. Why? What is the intention? They didn't know why Jesus asked them to do, to do that. Maybe he broke emotionally, you know, after all this suffering and attacks and, and toll in this job he had, he finally gave in. I mean, he is broken now. So he wants to open graves now. I mean, what's next? You never know. So he's out of control, maybe. Maybe he wants to see his friend for the last time. Maybe that's what he wants. Nobody knows. 
This is the peak of the emotionally charged story. I see it as a peak. When Jesus says, take away the stone, I can hear the silence after all this weeping. There was a silence. Like, what is next now? What follows? This is one very important lesson we have to learn from this text that will mirror our main story that we can read at the very end of the Gospel of John, that on which I'm going to preach as my final. The taking away of the stone is the beginning of the so-called final discourse of the Gospel of John. Structurally, this is the, the, the beginning of the end. The stone that have been taken away at the end of the Gospel was the end of the final discourse of the Gospel of John. There were two stones standing in, in, front of the, in front of the final discourse and at the end of the final discourse. The truth that we can take away from these two stories is one topic I want to share with you. is relationship. Why was Jesus on that particular grave? Why was Jesus there? I believe there were other funerals that day. Many other people died. But at that day, Jesus was on that grave. He was there for a reason. And the reason was relationship. The relationship that Jesus built with his followers. The relationship Jesus builds is a relationship in which there is no politeness. Jesus is never polite. Believe me. We're polite. God bless you. Whatever. Jesus is not polite. Jesus is not creating safe spaces, you know, distance, personal distance. It means nothing to him. He goes deep in your heart. There is substantial difference between the relationships we build around with our friends and relatives and the one we build with Jesus. Of course, in our preaching, we have to use the ordinary categories we understand in order to understand our relationship with Jesus. But the relationship with Jesus is so much more and so much deeper. Jesus, let's, let's begin with this. Jesus is our friend. Amen? Amen. Amen. He's the friend of sinners, I mean, after all. I mean, this is what he called his disciples. I have called you my friends. And this is true. But this description is not exhausting the definition of our, of, of our relationship. It's not. It's much more than that. He's not just our friend. Just a few hours before Jesus called them friends, he asked them, the disciples, how do you call me? And they said, well, teacher and master. We call you our teacher and our master. Now Jesus did not react in a way like, ah, oh, it's too much, guys. We know each other. You can call me by my first name, you know. But no, he says, it's true, you call me master, and this is what I am to you. He's our master. We're his servants, and he's our master. But that's not also a complete picture. If you don't like that, you don't dig it, <laughs> but he's the creator, and we're creation, which means there is a categorical difference between us and him. Thomas called Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus did not correct him. So he is our God. Yet one of the most important aspects of this relationship is the family aspect of this relationship. As John starts his gospel, his wrap-up of his introduction is that whoever believes in the Son of God, he gave them the right, he gave them the permission to become sons of God and daughters of God. We are a family. Jesus is our brother. So there are so many aspects in this relationship. Friends, servants, Lord, Master, God, and brothers and sisters to Jesus. All of this is compiled in this relationship we built with Jesus. It is such a rich and deep relationship. In this relationship, He is the only one who knows the depths of us. He's the only one that reads our hearts. And he's the only one who knows the depth of our brokenness. 
and yet the one who loves us so deeply and has infinite mercy over all our lives. This is who Jesus is, and this is what the relationship is with Him. That is why in this relationship there is no room for politeness. What are, we, what are you going to be polite for? He doesn't know you. He reads your heart. He knows your thoughts, your mind. There is no politeness. There is no safe and personal distance. He reads your heart. I hope this does not scare you. It should give you peace. There is no room for politeness in this relationship and safe distance. He sums up this relationship on all or nothing. All or nothing. You're all in or nothing at all. This is the measure of this relationship. All in or nothing at all. Read all the parables and the teachings Jesus delivered and you will know what I'm talking about. It is like getting in marriage. You know, it's all or nothing. You know, if I entered in our marriage with a plan B, man, this marriage would fall apart very, very soon. Or with a reserve, you know, this would hardly be a marriage. Mm -hmm. And why is this like that? Why is this like that? Well, on this specific relationship is based your life, your resurrection, and your eternity. <laughs> what, is, what is more important than those things? Can you name one thing that is more important than those things? No. What can you put on the other end of the scale that would outweigh these aspects of you? Your life, the resurrection, and the eternity. How much, how much more personally can it get than the words of take away the stone? To me, this is probably the most personal story I've read in the New Testament between Jesus and someone. Take away the stone. Take away the stone. What is more personal than, than this, that someone traveled for days by foot, having sleepless nights, worried for you, cried over so many times for you, so many nights, to come and take care of you when everyone around you have given up on you. You're in the grave, which means everybody has said bye-bye to you. And then Jesus comes and says, take away the stone. How much more personal can it get than this? That when everyone around you have put you in the grave already. And Jesus comes in your life and says, take away the stone. You will live. You will wake up. You're not going to sleep. Not today. Resurrecting Lazarus. Bringing him back to life. Instead of celebration which surprised me instead of celebrating this beautiful miracle caused riot worry and anger towards Jesus which eventually resulted with cross of crucifixion and I see that you've talked about this the last week about the crucifixion the darkest hour in history there is a movie about Churchill named darkest hour but I believe there was another darker hour than this what do you think? How the world around you reacts when you, when you come back to life? You think there are going to be celebrations? What is your experience? Share it with me. You coming back to life. Your resurrection in the eyes of the others is judgment to their lives. And as in this case, this will never change. People around Jesus... The rulers around Jesus felt threatened by the resurrection of Lazarus. They felt threatened. They didn't rejoice. It was judgment on them. The stone that they moved away brought Lazarus back to life. Something that mirrored just a week later. Jesus did and said so many things that mirrored his death and resurrection. But his disciples understood all these things years later. And we come to our text for today. The other stone that was, that was rolled away from the tomb. And I'm reading John 21 to 9. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene 
came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone, there is a stone again, had been taken away from the tomb. So she, she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, you know, John never misses a point to introduce himself that he was the loved one, you know. Spoiled child. <laughs> and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and, I, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He, wa he saw the linen clothes lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus, lay, had uh, not lain with the linen clothes, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Amen. In this text, we can go into details and uh, just analyze all these things, because it's such a rich text. We can, we can take so much from this text. I'm just going to go in this this in the surface to see what we can actually see here. But I'm going to end up with a text that, that is in the following scene because I think this text is incomplete with the text that follows, without the text that follows. The first thing that we should notice in this text, John starts, is, John starts with, with the words, the first day of the week. The first day of, so, so to speak, the new week. There's something new going on here. There's something that is so strange, they cannot explain it. Something different is happening. Apostle John cannot help himself echoing the Genesis story of the creation, introducing the first day of the new creation. Something new happened. And they still don't know what to do with that. They just go there, see something strange is happening, they don't know what to do with it. John many times echoes the Genesis story in his gospel. And trying to introduce the new creation happening with Jesus in every aspect. If you see the first words of the, of the gospel of John. You know how it starts? In the beginning. Wow. Literally echoing the Genesis story. Even here. The first day of the week is the first day of the creation, is the first day of the new creation. Something new is happening. John is introducing the aspect of the kingdom of God already, but not yet in completion. Now the second thing we can actually witness here is the bravery of the women. Mary Magdalene, she's a hero of mine. I have to say. Now, while the mighty men of God were hiding behind the closed doors, Mary Magdalene was there at the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark. Now, I'm not speaking about Scopia dark with street lights and everything, you know. It's, it's amazing. I mean, I can go in Scopia wherever I want in the dark. I'm speaking first century dark. Graveyard, I mean, crucified so-called rebel with Roman guards on, at his grave. And they're ready to charge at anyone that comes closer to the grave. And this is where the Mary Magdalene goes. I remember the darkness. I mean, wherever we go in the civilized world, you cannot experience real darkness. I remember sleeping in the tent in Africa, in the jungle. I mean, that's dark. It's really dark. Uh, you cannot see a thing in front of you. And you hope to have a lamp with battery. Because if you have to go during the night somewhere, you, have, you need a lamp. You know. So, I'm, I'm speaking about this kind of dark. Which is pitch dark. There is no street lights. It, and it's, it's early in the morning. Well, and there is like guards. Guarding this.
the rebel grave, ready to kill anyone that comes close, because this is the whole point. They were there to protect the grave, because someone might come and steal the body, you know. So she goes there, heroically. Wow, she was there first thing in the morning. She didn't care. Now, the third thing may be what we can get from this text, because John repeats it twice. So when they repeat twice, it's important. And this is how fast he was. He was really fast. <laughs> he outran Peter, and he mentioned this twice. <laughs> I don't know if he was bragging or something. He felt that he should write this twice, you know. Feels like brag to me, but, you know, he, I mean, he, yet he balanced the story that even though he was very fast, faster than Peter, he, he was not brave. So Peter entered the grave first, which was great. This is going to be short. Now the, the final part, which I think is the most important part in this story. John introduces us to this very important principle of faith. Believe it or not, the essence of the relationship between us and God is in these few words recorded by John. Now listen to these two, uh, two verses, 8 and 9, that says this. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. So he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. John first believed, yet he couldn't understand. Now, what is very important to get from this text is that belief precedes understanding. Belief precedes understanding. I don't believe because I understand, but I believe so that I can understand. Do you understand the difference? It's very, very different. John believed before he could understand what is going on. You know, without faith, it is impossible to please God, right? It is all in these few words, John explaining to us what he experienced. It is not written in theological system like Paul did, but it is obvious from this experience he had. Witnessing the stone taken away and the empty tomb, he believed so that he could understand later and write his beautiful gospel. So that we can all believe and understand that Jesus is the Son of God and believing in Him, we might have eternal life. It's the end of the 20th chapter. Yet for me, the scene, this scene is finished with the episode that follows. There are lots of question marks in the air. And this is basically the experience, the experience of the first Easter. Lots of confusion. If you just read the text, you cannot unsee the confusion that is in the text. They don't know what is happening. Lots of confusion, fear, questions. Everything is there. I mean, Peter was so desperate, he went back to fishing. I mean, and then Jesus shows up and everything becomes clear. There are things in the story with continuity that matters. Now, now listen to this. There is discontinuity in some things, but there is also continuity in some other things that, that matter. And we should focus on these things. The relationship with Jesus, with Mary Magdalene, this is what matters. The relationship aspect is what matters. I call her, and the church calls her, the apostle to the apostles. That's how they called her. Because she was commissioned by, by our Lord to deliver the gospel message to the apostles. Regarding her, there was no politeness. There was no safe distance. She was there. She didn't care. This is the conclusion of the episode. Her returning to the grave, lamenting over her teacher, Master, friend, she thought she saw the gardener. That is what she thought she saw. Shows up and starts conversation with her. And after short ridiculous conversations, like where is the body? And it's just so Jesus was playing along. By the way, this is what happened. Jesus said to her, 
Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabuni, which means teacher. One word. There was no theological explanation. There was no, well, let me tell you the parallels in the Old Testament of what happened. No. Mary, this is all that it took. Mary, this resonated very deep in her. The relationship matters. The relationship remains. Mary, Mary recognized the tone of this voice of Jesus. She might have missed the appearance. The last she remembered was like three days ago, two days ago. He was, he, he didn't look like himself. And she, she couldn't recognize him. But she recognized him in the relationship she's built by that point. Lazarus, Mary, the disciples. The turning point, what matters was the relationship that remained after this. I have some questions for all of us. Do you build your relationship with Jesus? Do you build it? Or you think it's a system of beliefs? I'm going to be straight with you. There are so many better systems than Christianity. Believe me. They're so clear. And I mean, even in, in, the, in the Islam, they're like, it's very clear. Five times in the day you pray, period. It's very clear. In Christianity, it's not that clear, you know. So, so should we fast? When? How do we pray? I mean, it's just, it's a mess. So if you're looking just for a system, I recommend It's the relationship with Jesus. So are you building this relationship with Jesus? Have you created maybe safe space in this relationship? Maybe you've distanced from Jesus. Are you maybe polite in your prayers? Have you analyzed your prayers? Maybe you're polite. You know, you try to present yourself as the best example of yourself. I do that. I do that. He knows you. He knows your name. Mary. This is all what this is all that they took. Zhivko. <laughs> Marino. I don't know. Mary. He knows your name. I just have my final message for you. Rejoice. He is risen. Amen. There is no fear. There is no death. There is no dirt that can stain you that, that he cannot wash you with his blood. He is one. He is one. He is on the other side of death. And we follow him there. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. Let us rejoice. Amen. Amen. Amen.